Hi, Gregor. Thank you so much for uh, just agreeing to this discussion and conversation. I'm excited to uh, learn from you. Um, diving right in, you have been very bullish on re renewable energy. But from your writing, even you have been surprised at how fast it's growing. Can you explain what is going on for people that aren't studying the growth in alternative energy and how this lines up with industry projections and I guess the common narrative around or the commonly understood narrative around alternative energy? Sure, I mean, part of the explanation has to do with the unique properties of wind and solar but the broader explanation has to do with growth and really the theory of growth or growth laws and these these theories of growth or growth laws are repeated across domains uh, across time and if if you're a venture capitalist you're 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 not only familiar with these growth laws, but they're the, they're the thing that's most important to you because they govern how quickly a small thing can become a big thing, okay? And so wind and solar are also stories of how a small thing becomes a big thing. What people perhaps aren't as aware of is wind and solar, like many other new technologies, actually had to spend a long time in the trenches being ignored and, and simply stuck in being small things. That was true in the 1990s. Uh, it was also true between the year 2000 and 2010. Even though investment capital got very excited about green energy between say 2005 and 2008. And that was partly driven by uh, the pressure that was, that was coming into commodities in the oil market. What was happening with wind and solar is that from a technological standpoint, they were still just almost immeasurable portions of the global energy system, really tiny, and they hadn't crossed yet those key economic thresholds to make them competitive economically. And so the big upsweep that we started to see this decade, because this, decade, this really gets going around 2010. That happens because of all the, the time in the wilderness, right? To use a, a phrase that Winston Churchill used that they just spent, they logged many years in, in the wilderness. And then of course, and we'll, we'll get into this more, what, what began to happen was the manufacturing rate or the learning rate began to kick in and you know, the, when I explain the manufacturing rate or the learning rate, I often use the example of a lawnmower. You know, the first gas powered lawnmower is the most expensive lawnmower that's ever been built on the planet. It, it requires an enormous amount of human capital uh, investment money, trying to figure out how to make a prototype that's safe so that your dad can use it at his house, right? It's the most expensive lawnmower ever produced. The millionth lawnmower is, is unbelievably cheap to produce. The profit is flowing on that, on that lawnmower to the, we'll call it the Toro company. And it's probably a better lawnmower than, than the first lawnmower. That's what's happened with wind and solar. And uh, just to put a little sticky note on our conversation here, we should probably talk about offshore wind because there the learning rate has really done something revolutionary. So to wrap this up and answer your question, the, the reason that people often feel like, wow, I missed this. Wow, what happened? W where did wind and solar come from? They, they came from a long distance away. They were coming towards us for a long time and they finally broke over those key cost thresholds. And then end of story. They're just absolutely ferocious monsters of growth. And that's where we are today. So I wanna, I wanna, I want to explore more of where we're going now mm -hmm. because we're on this growth curve and you just said something that's like red meat for me to hear is about revolutionary things still happening. 
can you explore what is what revolutionary things are happening and what should we be paying attention to, for example, in wind? And where does that take us going forward? Okay. Before I get to wind, let me tell you a little story. Uh, I know, like stories, so this yeah, is good. <laughs> as, a, as a journalist and a, and a reporter, I just try to soak up as much information as, as possible. And so about a year ago, I sat in on a corporate uh, presentation by a utility company called Pacific Corp. Uh, Pacific Corp is actually a subsidiary of, uh, of Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. And like many American utilities, it has a legacy uh, bag of assets that were built up essentially in the post-war period. A lot of it coal with some natural gas. And in recent years, it started to add uh, some wind and some solar. Now, utilities run sophisticated computational analytical models to try to figure out what every business tries to figure out. What's the optimal mix of its assets? Where's the best place to invest next? What might, what might be some future costs that are coming down the line that could really hurt profitability? And where should the company go in the future so that it is, so that in the year 2030, it's in a good place. And so to do this, they run something called a Monte Carlo simulation. And a Monte Carlo simulation, which I cannot explain to you on a mathematical level, but what's wonderful about it is it spits out just myriad possibilities. Like it will say, hey, Pacific Corp, this is what you, this is what would happen to you if you not only stuck with your coal, but actually built all your coal, built even more coal and went 100% coal to the year 2030. Here's what would happen if you went all wind. Here's what would happen if you went all solar. So in the presentation, even the executives at Pacific Corp were surprised that every time they ran the model, putting in the new prices for wind and solar and, and the new li future liabilities for, for coal, the model kept spitting out, close your coal by 2028. Oh wait, close your coal by 2026. Oh wait, close your coal by 2022. And then the next one, you should shut all your coal down now and build wind and solar, okay? So um, that's one example of how exciting this moment is because we've completely departed the world of policy when it comes to figuring out, should you build wind or solar? And I, I haven't forgotten your question about- Wait, wait, can, uh, you could just explain yeah. what that means. I think that's a very yeah. important point. I think yeah. what you mean is that you no longer need government incentives to build renewable energy, which is good for all of us. That's correct. Is, is that what you mean? That is absolutely correct. You still need some government incentives in other areas, probably EV still, because that sticker price hasn't come down. We'll probably, we'll probably get into that. But we've now fully departed from the, from the world of needing incentives. There will always be some incentives. I mean, Economies are complex. I and mean, one report I did, piece of journalism I did that was fascinating last year was I, I, I reported on how East Coast ports, right, which have been fallow for like 40 years. These are, in, this has been my part of the world where I grew up in New England, New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, New London, Connecticut, places like this that have been forgotten, you know, since World War II, since they were fishing ports. They're now being revived as launch pads for what will be a new American offshore wind industry. And so probably someone five years from now will say, hey, that offshore wind industry got some subsidies through the state of Connecticut because the state of Connecticut threw some money into the port and the, and the, uh, you know, the, the Norwegian company that set up the wind farm got a little help from that. But you know, it's brushing all that aside the offshore wind industry doesn't need subsidies anymore. It knows how to get the job done, deliver a product at a great price, make some profit for everybody, you know, along the way. So yeah, that's where we are. And so going back to the revolutionary part, mm -hmm. what what is what what is exactly going on in wind? That oh, 
Okay. That gets well, you so is, excited. Yeah, this also gets back to your original question, how the, even the experts were wrong. I, I guess I'll reluctantly call myself an expert. I, I'm an expert in understanding our current position and where we're likely to go next. That's about as far as I'll claim my expertise. I'm not a material scientist or a, or a wind power uh, technician or engineer. Um, okay, here's the thing that's just, Aaron, I gotta tell you, th this is the thing that has really surprised me. So the rate at which the cost to build new utility scale solar, I knew it was coming down, right? Like Warren, Warren Buffett actually went in and completed a big old project in, in California called Topaz, which at the time was the biggest solar, solar array in the world. I've actually flown over it. Um, in fact, here's a funny story. This is true. I was flying once from Portland to San Diego to attend Howard Lindzen's Stock Twits conference. Oh, that's good. Um, right. And my and and a key part of my presentation was Topaz, right? I wanted to explain to the audience that it needed to think about solar and wind. It needed to be cautious about uh, oil and gas investments. And this was like 2016, I think I went down to give this presentation. So as I'm sitting there on the airplane and I've chosen my window seat carefully uh, to look over my slide deck, I look down and what do I see? Topaz, it's right there <laughs> underneath me. Looks like a big black microchip on, a, on, a, on the circuit board of the desert. So, so, I, so I knew that solar was going in that direction. In other words, back to the learning rate. The more you man, when you start manufacturing 500,000 lawnmowers, now you're learning a lot about how to make a lawnmower better and how to make it and how to have your input costs be cheaper. And you get to the millionth. This is what was starting to happen in global solar last decade. China was really beginning to manufacture those panels. And what was happening is a, a kind of deflationary boom was, was beginning. And we'll, we, this is another subject we might get into, but it's kind of hard. It was kind of hard to be a panel maker, like a first solar, because you're offering so much value in in the technology and making better panels, and yet the price of your panels, a little bit like microchips, it you know it's hard to get pricing power. So I knew that that was happening, but around 2016, I said to myself, you know, the one place where we're probably not going to see further cost. Uh, declines and gains is offshore wind. Because like offshore wind is just a really hard thing to do. You need these massive ships and you're deploying these just improbably large pieces of infrastructure. And especially in the North Sea, I mean, like the North Sea is famous from the oil and gas industry for, for killing people and sinking boats. And so I thought, you know, that's, that's probably not gonna happen. And then it happened. And it just, it sort of rips my face off a little bit, but it's another example of, of the learning rate. You know, it's another part of the energy sector that went through the learning rate, fracking. Okay, I mean, yes. in 2007, 2008, I would have told you tight oil, sure, it's there and sure you can get it out, but you know, good luck making, making a profit, right? And, and so then fracking went through this amazing learning rate in which the techniques improved, the cost drops, the knowledge base increased, the tools to discover the oil and extract it got better. And so that's, that's what's happened in, in wind power. And um, we've now got just crazy, crazy wind, offshore wind power uh, plans all around the UK. And now, as I said, it's coming to the East Coast. I mean, all those states on the on the Eastern Seaboard, from Virginia to my original home state of Massachusetts, have all signed on to deploying pretty big quantities of wind offshore, and they'll just run those cables right into those dense populations. So yeah, the thing, the thing that someone should write a book about cost drops in offshore wind. I think that would be you know that that book would go straight to the shelf at Harvard Business School. You'd you'd want to study that and learn from that. 
You know, that that's really interesting to to try to uh, absorb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you share just in numbers what kind of growth we're talking about in the U.S.? Yeah. So yeah. that people can really yeah. understand. I don't know if you want to start yeah. in 2010 yeah. or in 2000, 2005. Like yeah. in, in solar and wind, what kind of growth have we experienced? And, and, and from reading your newsletter, you've been one of the most bullish on these. And it's even exceeded your forecast. I'm curious of where you think it's going. Okay, well, you've asked the right person to explain uh, growth of wind and solar to the to to an audience of people who are interested but but don't necessarily understand these things because that's that's kind of like my game um, is translating these somewhat semi scientific and data points to, you know, sort of a story that people can understand. I also have, I'm going to start out though with a helpful hint. Um, we measure the growth of wind and solar power in two ways. We can measure the capacity, which is the actual hardware, right? So like I mentioned, Topaz is a half a gigawatt uh, solar plant. Uh, you now have one gigawatt solar plants and Australia wants to build a 10 gigawatt solar plant. That would, that would definitely be the biggest that the world has ever seen and just crazy, crazy large. So you, so you can measure uh, the capacity of these plants in gigawatts. And by the way, that's exactly how you measure a coal plant and a, and a natural gas plant. So if, if you go to Wikipedia, if you, if you live in the state of Ohio and you say, hey, I wonder, how, I wonder what the size of these existing coal plants are here in the state of Ohio. You just Wikipedia Ohio coal plants and they'll tell you one is four tenths of a gigawatt, another one is 1.2 gigawatts, okay? So that's a measure of capacity. But here's the helpful hint. When it comes to wind and solar, which do not run 24 seven, 365, like a nuclear power plant or a coal plant. What you really care about is the generation, the output. What you really care about is the volume of electricity that these plants produce. So yes, when you look across the world, various countries will report how much solar they built in gigawatts. But what you really care about is how much new solar generation was, was produced last year in China. Sure, tell me the gigawatts, but what I really care about are the terawatt hours, that's TWH. And in this world that we are moving into, which is going to be more of an electrified world, I'd say every person you know, who is an investor and in finance, you should get familiar with those three letters, capital T, capital W, lowercase h, TWH, terawatt hours. That measures the actual usable amount of electricity that's available to people and industry to society, okay? So I'm gonna describe the growth of American wind and solar, not in gigawatt terms, because that won't really help you fully understand how it's growing. I'm gonna describe it in what really matters, which is terawatt hours. So uh, I'm also gonna just describe the share count first, okay? So like in 2011, wind, combined wind and solar only provided 2.98% of American electricity. At that point, coal was still providing a very large amount of US electricity. And then there was natural gas creating US electricity and also hydro. By 2014, combined wind and solar were providing 5.13% of US electricity. Wow, that's, now that's not quite a doubling from 2011, but look at that. Just in three years, uh, wind and solar goes from 3% to 
Now we come five years forward from 2014 to 2019, 9.65%. Okay, there's a doubling. That, that's five to basically 10% in five years, okay? Now, let me just pause here. If you're an investor in a startup, if you're an investor um, in a new technology, and you see that technology cross the 5% share level, like wind and solar did in 2014, uh, that's your go signal that uh, things are about to get pretty exciting because as we know from, again, growth studies and growth laws, uptake of new technology, it's called, in, in a business book, it's called the diffusion of innovation. Some people think of it as an S curve, right? Long, slow, plodding, no growth at the bottom. And then all of a sudden, boom, it sweeps upward majestically. And then the growth tapers off. We're in that fat part of the curve. Okay. We come up off the bottom. So well, I'm curious in terms of that bottom yeah. curve, what, what yeah. was it in two in like 2000 or 2005? Do, do you have those figures? I do. Uh, I'd have to load up my Excel spreadsheet, but I can tell you it was either at 1% or below 1%. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, that's helpful. Just in yeah. terms of thinking about yeah. like that it was at 1%, slowly increasing the three. And then, and so I look out to 2030. Where do you now think that market share is going to be? Ah, okay. That's a good question. Now, um, so the barrier, the, the, let me put it this way, not barriers, the hiccups to getting to much higher shares is, has nothing to do with the capability of wind and solar. It'll have to do with how much intermittent intermittency from wind and solar can our power grids handle. And so from this year, 2021 to 2030, wind and solar will be standing right there available to grow as much as we want them to grow at an affordable price. But we're going to need to start pairing them with what I call big box storage, grid level storage, so that when the wind blows at night in Texas, right? Tex combined wind and solar in Texas provides more than 20% of the electricity that Texas needs, but it's very weighted towards wind, which blows at night. Texas is gonna need some batteries. It needs to bank that surplus uh, wind power at night so that it can get fed back into the grid during the day from a battery. You know how Texas is handling it's great volumes of wind power already. The local utilities basically have these great offers. If you're a Texas resident, charge up your car at night, run your dishwasher at night, charge up your home battery at night, do, do anything you possibly can after 9 p.m. because that's when all this surplus electricity is available on the grid. So when you ask me generally where we're heading towards the year 2030, we're we're probably heading past 30% share, okay? That's, that's generally where we're heading because we're at 12% now. I just, so I just, we did, went from I just did the point, num Yeah. We just we went, went from 9.65% and, and in 2020, we're at 12%? Yeah, we made that big leap in one year. Now there's a little baseline uh, adjustment there. I saw in your newsletter yeah. because of the decline. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no. That, so, yeah. So here, here's an interesting question. If we had the store, the battery storage technology and the infrastructure in place, where do you think the market share could be? Yeah, so uh, I'm glad you asked this because I'm not an absolutist and I recommend that people not measure the success of wind and solar uh, by whether or not it can provide 100% of the world's electricity. You show me a world where wind and solar provide like 65 or 70% of global electricity, I just plant my flag and say, we won the war at that point. No, for sure. That, that's yeah. what I mean. I'm, I'm yeah. not assuming that yeah. you're going to get to 100%. And yeah. it's probably not wise from a diversification. Yeah, you know. exactly. Yeah, but but once you get to six, once you get past fifty, yeah, 
the, the amount of traditional energy that you need is has to be so much lower, right? That's, cor that's correct. And there's also another adjustment. Now, here's a very upper level concept, which I, I see it arising in our conversation. I'm just going to throw it out there. This is, you know, this is for the advanced class um, and, and for further study, but I'll just explain it this way. And it's, it's a weird one. It's counterintuitive. <laughs> we can run the same world economy using renewables, but using less energy with renewables because renewables are so much more efficient compared to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels lose at least 40% of the energy that we burn goes into the atmosphere, right? So like, so like the amount of energy that it takes to move an electric vehicle one mile down the road is at least 40, is at least 60% less and really more like 70% less than the amount of fossil fuel energy it takes to move a vehicle one mile down the road. Don't get me wrong, oil, petroleum, jet fuel are very powerful, energy dense, miracle sources. So was coal, coal transformed the world. Let's, let's be clear about that. Coal powered the industrial revolution, no coal, no industrial revolution. You might've had an intellectual revolution. You might've had a, a revolution, a social revolution. You might've had a market revolution, but no industrial revolution without coal. Okay, so they're, they're amazing fuels, but they waste an enormous amount of their heat. It just, you know, it, it just escapes into the atmosphere. I mean, feel the hood of your, of your engine after you've driven up from San Diego to Los Angeles. It's hot. Oh, for sure, for sure. Right? So um, that's that upper, you know, in my, my little ebook, Oil Fall, I, 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 I get into those issues. This concept was difficult for me to, to accept really when I first encountered it, but it, it is simply a thermodynamic energy physics fact that if, if you start running your system on wind and solar, you just have less waste loss. And that's happening in California right now. And it, you know, when you plug in an EV, just to extend this comment, and we don't necessarily have to keep going with this. I just wanna make clear, when you plug an EV into the grid in Los Angeles, you're actually getting double efficiency because that grid has almost 25% of its electricity coming from wind and solar. Whereas if you plug in that EV into the outlet in Ohio, you're not getting that double effect because you're basically plugging into a system that doesn't have much wind and solar and it's still coal and natural gas. Exactly. Remember the EVs are still just, the EV in Ohio is just as efficient going one mile down the road as the EV in LA after you've unplugged, but what's coming out of the plug matters. So we, we are start. this is a, this systemic transformation that we're going through, it's top to bottom. It's from the gotcha. level of the car and it's the level of the power grid. It's complete and it's so exciting. Going back, to, yeah, yeah, very exciting. Going yeah. back to my question, if we had the, that the battery big box storage set up, or, or, do you think that we could get to possibly 50% in 2030 if we had that? Well, Not saying that we're going to get that, or is that, that, that will be too aggressive? I think that's too aggressive, but I do want you to know that we have the technology, we have the big box storage already, and its learning curve, right? The, the rate at which its cost to manufacture and its affordability, its learning curve is behind wind and solar. It, it, hasn't, it hasn't come into that juicy part of the curve where it's getting super cheap, but, it's become, but it is occurring. And if you actually look at the projects, the, the live real actual projects that are de being deployed for, I'll give you an example. There's a, there's a farmer owned community utility in the Great Plains states of Nebraska, Oklahoma, Kansas, 
and it's the, the utility itself is is corporate headquartered in in one of those states. They just did a big project last year, and by project I mean uh, planned a project of big wind and some solar, and they decided to pair a big box with it because big box storage has become affordable enough to start making that choice. Plus, put this another way, Aaron, think of it as a whole system. Your big box is expensive, but your wind is cheap. You take the cheapness of the wind and you put the expensiveness of the big box together, your whole system starts to get a lot more affordable. Plus, that big box gives you options. It gives you arbitrage opportunities. It makes you a potential market maker in the market for electricity, right? You could come into the market when prices are high and offer electricity from your big box and grab those higher prices, okay? We're, we're gonna move into a world where electricity is traded algorithmically, right? With, with owners of, of assets like big box storage being market makers, right? They're gonna take, they're gonna suck up their own surplus electricity when it's cheap and sell it back to the open market when prices are dear. Again, another sort of mind blowing thing. It's already happening. It's already, people have already, you know, it's like, I didn't figure this out. I'm just, I'm just telling, I'm just reporting. We're already, we're already there. But just to cap off this answer, storage needs to become cheaper. And no, I don't think 50% wind and solar in the US electricity system, even in the best case scenario is quite realistic for, for, 20, for, for 2030. I, I suppose I could be wrong about that, but I, I think that share from 12% last year to 50, I think that's probably too much, but, I, but I, I'll stick with my main pain. We're heading towards 30. That, that's the general grand, grand sweep of thing. We'll probably get above 30 and you know, we'll, we'll see how the economy goes. And uh, If I expand out the time horizon to 2040. <laughs> ah, okay. Well, yeah. Yeah, so you're that's talking easy. 19 yeah. years. Yeah, that's easy because, as you know, with exponential growth, it's those. Uh, eventually, growth slows down, but in the belly of the S curve, you're just going a lot faster than anyone thought. Uh, you know, than anyone thought possible. Yeah. And so this gets me to, you know, our traditional energy assets are they stranded assets? You know, this I'm phrase "stranded assets" has become. Uh, sort of a phrase of choice in recent years. I guess I've got a couple of thoughts about that. So there's always stranded assets as the world moves forward. Uh, archaeological ruins are a, a form of stranded asset uh, when you go visit them on your travels to Europe. Um, there are, you know, most most cities on the Eastern Seaboard have subway tunnels that are that are stranded that aren't being used, um, and and the way in which economies handle stranded assets is they, I would say they naturally amortize the losses over the year. You don't take all the losses in one year, right? Of the pipelines and the, and the natural gas plants, you suffer them chronically <laughs> from, from year to year, right? So yeah, there's going to be stranded. Look, California already has shut down uh, at least one or two natural gas plants that were built fairly recently because they're just not, they're, they're just not needed. And well, here, here's a better, here's a better yeah. question. Maybe yeah, that stranded assets is not the right phrase, but I'm, I'm talking to you as an investor. So maybe, uh, maybe okay. I should think of it more of, are these now cigar butts? Are they the potential shopping malls? that are being, you know, slowly decimated by e-commerce. What's the analog in other industries? Is it, is it like, I'm just making it up, but is it like the CD-ROM versus digital streaming? Um, you know, how, well, how would you have an investor, and, and I'm a value investor, right? So right now it looks like energy is on sale and that there's going to be a mean reversion and I can make 
quite a bit of money. And I think that all of this alternative energy or that the, that the world will have to move on from oil or natural gas is completely overblown. How would you, okay. how would you talk to me as a value yeah. investor yeah. feeling okay. the pull from energy? Okay. okay. Yeah. There's a couple of framings there that I think would be helpful to people when they quote, feel the pull to uh, at the very least enter oil and gas as a, as a short-term trade. Um, unfortunately, old coal plants and, and old natural gas plants and also other fossil fuel infrastructure like, like pipelines and so forth, they're, they're worse than old malls because there's actually a whole little cottage industry around the repurposing of, of existing malls. And, and malls don't typically sit or create environmental uh, footprint or environmental waste uh, resi residual footprints so that you know you don't have those environmental uh, cost risks as as well, um, but let me let me give you the framing that I think I'm glad this is coming up because I always like to answer this question, and and I've thought about this fairly deeply. If you're an investor and you want to take a look at the energy sector, you need to think first about the difference between fossil fuel dependency and fossil fuel growth. Let me define fossil fuel dependency. I believe even as bullish as I am on wind and solar, you know, basically taking over the world, there will be fossil fuel dependency for the rest of this century and you and I won't be alive and, and there will be fossil fuel dependency right up to the year, uh, you know, for the next hundred, you know, for the next 80 years. Okay. There'll be a long tail of usage. Why? Because petroleum's a unique product and it it's very key to, to agriculture. Uh, so just so is natural gas, you know, to fertilizer. It's very key to, to plastics and material science. And by the way, I'm pretty bullish on material science and petroleum-based uses of 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 chemicals and so forth as we go forward into this century. But, but you must also pay attention to growth. And if there's no growth, you can't fall back on the dependency argument. This is the mistake that people often make. A typical conversation goes, hey, wind and solar are taking over the world uh, and you know they're gonna kill fossil fuels. Yes, but not quite like that. And then the other investor says, look, I don't think we're just getting on wind and solar fast enough, so I'm gonna go long fossil fuels. No, that's a problem too. You know, he says like, we're not getting off, uh, you know, oil so soon. Yeah, that's true, but what about no growth? See, the entire global coal sector went bankrupt in 2012, 2013, 2014. Okay, maybe not the entire, but, but the listed global coal sector that was tradable on stock exchanges, most of it went bankrupt around that time. Why? Because growth ended. Do you, know where, do you know where coal dependency is right now? It's not that far below to those 2013 levels. Global coal usage is in a dependency phase, but there's no more growth. Who wants to invest in that? I mean, the only investment opportunity you've got in global coal is to maybe buy some metallurgical coal on the futures exchange during a recession and then riding it back up as industrial activity restarts again and steel making fires back up again. That's it. And as far as I'm concerned, that's basically where oil and gas are right now. Of course, oil is a trade right now. We're coming out of a pandemic year. Oil, global oil demand is gonna grow at least 6% this year, but it's a baseline effect. It's gonna grow 6% from the smash you know, from the SmackDown lows of last year, but it's but it's not even going to get back up to the 2019 highs of demand. And now, oil is just in a world of shit because it just doesn't have growth prospects. So oil growth rate, the oil growth rate on an annual basis, was already running into trouble in 2019. So if you feel the pull towards energy, and you want to play 
you know, a refining, the refining complex for a couple of months as we go into driving season, I can definitely understand, you know, people doing that, but it's no longer an investment. It just That's what you're describing is yeah. just the, that oil and gas has become a trade, which really is you're hoping to flip it to the greater fool yeah. because there is yeah. no longer growth. No. So you're just hoping someone else pays a higher price, assuming yep. that they have a rosier view of the future and the future is a no growth future. So yeah. it's just a uh, it, it's just a trade. Yeah, and, and you know, there will be the typical sophisticated hedge fund strategies where you strangle or collar a basket of dividend paying stocks like Exxon Mobil with other offsetting trades so that you're basically just clipping the dividend, right? Like that would be like a, you know, a dividend carve out, you know, um, uh, structured trade. So there'll be a bunch of that going on. There's, there's, you know, there's, there's, there will be vulture strategies for the oil and gas sector that will go on for, for years and years. I should say though, you know, chemicals and material science, um, those are in a world that's going towards batteries and electric cars and wants to create lighter vehicles and, you know, the carbon fork on my new, you know, cause I just got a custom made bicycle made for me and, and it has a carbon fork on it. Excited about that. You know, it's all these materials <laughs> and things that's all, that's all going to happen. As I said, the long tail of, of petroleum use is there. It, but there's no, not going to be any growth for it. But you'll have a rebound year in 2021. You'll see the data is going to come in and it's going to be like global demand is off the charts. Americans are back in their cars. The, you're, even, the, you're, you know, you get, even the Europeans are driving again. You'll get that stuff like that. And maybe that, maybe that story blows right through the traditional shoulder, what's called the shoulder season for energy investors in April and May. And maybe it blows right through to Fourth of July, but that's pretty much where the coal sector trade has been for 2013. Just picking up some of those deep, deep lows, especially in the met metallurgical coal, and then just getting out. You know. So. so I'm interested in something you said that that strikes me is that I hadn't considered before. Is if you think about a longer tail for natural gas and for oil. Mm -hmm. And and that maybe without some of these price spikes or a, just a more sustainably lower oil price, then maybe you'll have some opportunities to be an investor on the chemical side or the material sciences side that takes advantage of all this excess oil and natural gas that we will have available since it's not being used as part of the power or um, transportation sector is it did i am i understanding that yes, right yes i am yeah yeah absolutely and you know when oil gets cheap those industrial users of oil pr generally speaking presumably they will go into the market and hedge their forward exposure um you know for for oil and lock in those lower prices. That's probably, you know, I, I took a look at the refiners, um, you know, in the last couple of weeks that their share prices are doing well. I'm just gonna guess that like th those companies have long institutional knowledge and, and, and talent for buying oil when it's cheap. And of course that's awesome because refining is just a, an arbitrage. You, you try to buy the cheapest barrel of oil you can and then you bring the product to market uh, during current retail prices, and that's you know that's how you make money. But yeah, I think you know I, I heard Jeff Curry, uh, who's from Goldman Sachs, on a podcast the other day with with Jeff Joe uh, Weisenthal and, and Tracy Alloway, uh, the Odd Lots podcast on Bloomberg. I I, I really like Jeff when I back in the days when I was thinking almost every minute only about oil. You know, he really helped explain the world, but I have to disagree. He's got this idea that there's going to be another commodities super cycle. And, you know, I've written in my newsletter, I wrote, I wrote a whole big issue called material world. And I, I acknowledge that 
deploying uh, new energy technology and new EV uh, at a rapid rate this decade will definitely bring a new call on on commodities and resources. But the last time we had a commodity super cycle was when a single enormous country, China, a sovereign, went through an industrial revolution. I just don't like I, I don't see that being repeated again. So I'm 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 I uh, I disagree with the idea of a commodity super cycle, but I'm constructive. I'm positive about the outlook for for commodities and resources this decade. Not in any spectacular inflationary way, but definitely you know like lith things like lithium and copper. You know copper copper is a big big part of uh, renewable energy build out, especially windmills, silver even. You know silver. Silver is a component in solar manufacturing. And in fact, the solar sector has, has filled the hole left by photography for, for, the, global, for the global silver production into, industry. And, and back to the learning curve, you know, solar is getting better at using less silver per panel produced, but with the growth rate, you know, solar industry is going to use a lot of silver. So I'm constructive on all these commodities. And, 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 and oil just did what you'll probably see it do multiple times this decade. It will go back down to $25, $20, $20 a barrel. Um, it will go in lulls. It'll come back up to 50 or 55 and go back down again. So You know what strikes me is what you said, and I forget where I heard this before. Um, but when you're really betting on these commodities, you're really betting against technology at this point. That's and, true. And that's, that's yeah. kind of a, I just, that's been a bad bet in a lot of ways. If Not you're making, if you're making a 10 year bet on copper, you're betting against technology, but you might not be betting against technology if you make a three year bet on copper. No, right? that's a very good point. That's a very yeah. good point. Um, yeah. And so be, Beyond the obvious, where are the opportunities that you think investors are not exploring? Well, I, I just think there are some basic investment themes that that an investor who's not, you know, uh, an expert in energy or infrastructure. I mean, you should. I mean. The solar industry has a whole bunch of publicly listed companies, and you can, you know, you can get, you can, you can get a basket of those companies in an ETF. And like, people should have, like, I mean, seriously, I, I just help a family member set up a basic, uh, allo you know, allocation portfolio for rebalancing every ninety days, and I, you know, I, I help them put in, I think it was fifteen percent or twenty percent to renewable energy, which was basically wind power, solar power, you know, probably some batteries and, and things like that. I didn't, I didn't want it to be much larger for them, but because, you know, I think maybe these share prices kind of go crazy. Well, they sort of already have. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, it, and also an investment in solar is uh, an investment in the power grid to a certain extent. I mean, there's a, there's an ETF that I've just, I'm like anyone else, I, I mean, I have retirement accounts. So like there's an ETF that I've been in for a long time called Grid. I think it's, uh, it's either, I think it's First Trust. Um, it's just, it's just a index of electronic equipment makers, right? It's like ABB and Siemens and Enphase and SolarEdge and um, Honeywell and things like that. The, if you, just to paint a broad stroke, because, you know, I'm not, recommending any individual names, but I mean, you just take a look at a, agencies like the IEA in Paris, and they'll tell you how many trillions are going to be invested in the power grid, just the growth of the power grid, right? The, you know, the actual physical thing and the, all the switching and the terminals and the batteries and so forth, that's just going to suck up trillions of dollars of investment to the year 2040. That's just like your average investor who's just saving for retirement should have some exposure to that. So, That's really smart. You know, one of the, yeah. my favorite things is just 
And this is why I've loved this conversation is the older I get, the less I want to do trading, <laughs> the more I yeah. just want to invest <laughs> and have this secular tailwind behind yeah. me so I can sleep at night and I don't really have to worry about any day or quarter because I know what's coming. And what I love about what you just said, and it's going to make me go do a whole bunch of work on the, the main suppliers, you mentioned a few, um, to the grid, is you know what has to happen to the power grids, not just in the US, but around the world. You know the trillions of dollars that, has to, that, that are going to be spent. And it doesn't take rockets. Now, to, to figure out the precision would be, would be very hard, but it's not, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to say that 10 years from now, that's going to be a great business or uh, over the long term is going to grow faster than maybe economic growth. Yeah. And in fact, you know, just to put a little macro phrase on top of this, I've been writing for a couple of years now a as a way to really help people understand what is happening, what's going to happen is that the next unit of global GDP is far more likely to be built on top of the power grid rather than liquid fossil fuels than it, than it was 10 years ago. And five years from now, it, it, that, will, that equation will basically continue to become truer and truer and truer as we move into this decade. And again, it, 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 that framing admits that petroleum will have the long tail, but when, but you know, back in the 40s and 50s, economic growth was just super tightly coupled to the growth of oil consumption. I mean, it's just right there in the data in the post-war period in the in the developed world in Europe, Japan, and and the United States. You know, you want a new unit of GDP? You better news use a couple of new units of of oil. That equation has broken down. And that's another way of thinking about, so if that's true, which I believe it is, and it's already true, then that, that tells you that the, the big sort of, uh, you know, down the middle of the strike zone um, trend is electricity and, and the growth of the electricity system. And the, the as I said, the algorithmic uh, air traffic controlling of electricity and then all the stuff you build on top of that. It's like the electricity system is going to become to be seen more as a more as a platform. It already is interesting little your average charging company now, Aaron, like, like take take a charging company, right? There's a couple of charging company SPACs at the moment. There's some existing charging companies that are owned by bigger companies. They're already in the power grid with their cool little technological devices that a EV user can use to soak up power when it's cheap and not take power when it's more expensive. See, that, that's the electricity grid as a, almost like a stock market of electricity, basically with you know, thousands of individual users and the companies as intermediaries, you know, getting for themselves what they need, when they need, at prices when they want, you know, just that that's where that's where this is all uh, headed. And that's why I said, you know, IEA is, you know, it's a mind blowing number of trillions that will have to be invested in the power grid. By the way, the US has old power grid infrastructure in the same way it has old coal and old natural gas infrastructure. So there's going to be a whole infrastructure upgrade cycle that's got to come as well. Right. So. No, and, and what also strikes me is that with all the speculative fervor around, well, a lot of it in electric vehicles, but also in battery and LIDAR and now charging stations mm -hmm. and is all of this money while it's only going to accelerate the future. This is what the internet bubble showed me is you throw all these billions, hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars at something and people get really excited. And, and uh, there will be companies that don't work out and there will be disappointing investments and 
uh, you, people will lose money. And, but in the end, it's going to accelerate that future and accelerate the, you know, going back to our original, you know, point, it's going to accelerate that renewable future, the technology coming forward, the cost curves coming down. Um, and you can see it happening. Bubbles are actually a very effective way to get new technology distributed. And if you're a, 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 a if you're an investor with good risk management, you can catch uh, the bulk of that move without getting hurt. If you put all your money in a single stock that is probably a great stock at a great time, uh, taking advantage of this growth and just goes absolutely crazy to the upside, that's exciting. But that stock will have a high degree of sensitivity to, it, it will feel out the tiniest little fluctuations in the growth rate a year or two up ahead, it will figure that out and it will correct many times along the way. And eventually it will, it will go to sleep for a while, even as, you, even as you're waking up into a brand new world that that's, you know, that that company was taking advantage of. So it's uh, bubbles. Uh, there's, they get a lot of criticism because they, when they, when they burst, uh, you know, people get hurt. Are we in, a, you know, I've dealt with this in my newsletter. Are we in a bubble now for new energy technology and SPACs and EV and stuff? You know, probably, I mean, or I mean, at least a little bit of a one, right? But, but like many bubbles, it has a fundamental underpinning and uh, you can either just sit back and enjoy the, the benefits to society with cleaner energy and better technology, you, or you can also invest responsibly in it and do really well, right? Like you don't have to, it's like what you were saying, you know, you, you don't have to, um, you don't have to have put your, put your skull, your white skull t-shirt on, your black t-shirt with a skull on it with like a death or glory, you know, death, yeah, you don't have no, to be a death or glory trader, right? No, that's exactly right. Gregor, I've really enjoyed this. You've given me so much to think about. <laughs> if uh, I want to encourage anyone who is an energy investor, any investor at all to subscribe to your newsletter, where can they find you? Where can they find your newsletter? Uh, yeah, you more? just... Yeah, so uh, I use my name as my as part of the newsletter because I just my, my name has been out there for you know for over ten years in journalism and writing about this stuff. So the name of my newsletter is the Gregor Letter, and you'll just that'll just come up immediately as a top search in in Google. And I'm at Substack.com with the Gregor. Letter. You can also find me on Twitter at Gregor McDonald, and that's M A C D O N A L D. Its name's just spelled out like it is G R E G O R McDonald. So I'm I'm pretty easy to find on the internet now. Um, my 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 son said, "Dad, are you a famous person?" I said, "No, but it is easy to find me on the internet." <laughs> I guess that's one measure. So that's great. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this, and you've. Um, you've helped educate me and, and I, I'm very appreciative of that. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. It was a pleasure.